Welcome, everyone. Hey, Helen, Jackie, Lily, Lisa. Diana, Hi, Jackie. Hey, Mary. And Lily. Hi. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> hey, Jackie. Hey, Kathy. Should he made it? Hi, Yay for the Miss Foundation. Hey, Elaine from Seattle. Hello. <laughs> Not anymore. I wish we could see you in person. Can you see me? Hi, Joyce. Hi, Holly. Hi. Hi. Hey, congrats to Sean for graduating high school today. Thank you, thank you. I feel like I graduated. You did. Yeah. Hey, Teresa. Yeah, Teresa, we all the Brooklynites, we should have lunch together. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Jenny, hi. Helen. Hi, okay. Nice to see you all. Hey, Paula Liang. Hi. Monona. Welcome everyone. Hi, Helen. Now to the rise in attacks against Asian Americans across the country. I was speaking to a pollster during the recent elections and I asked him why when I see polling results broken down by race. Do I so rarely see Asian Americans as a separate category? I am Asian. I am American. I'm proud 
I am strong. And I am here to stay. I love the Asian Women Giving Circle because I believe in the power of collective giving. Because of friendships, which are so important to get me through the isolation of last year. Because it unites an incredible community of women for an important mission that has never been more urgent. Because of the intergenerational sisterhood. Because we fund artists using their craft to bring about social justice and equity. Because I think it is the most authentic reflection of philanthropy. For all the fabulous Asian American women who are working every day to make our world a better place. Because we're stronger together. I believe in the power of arts and education and culture to bring us new ways to see, think, and hear the world around us. So there. <laughs> I am in Q and I'm directing and producing a short documentary with Red Canary Song. We are a grassroots collective of AAPI sex workers who base build with migrant massage workers. At Jihadji Sisters, as Indo-Caribbean intersectional feminist, we believe deep in our hearts that our liberation is tied to the liberation of Black people. And until Black people get free, none of us will be free. I'm Jamie Sun Wu, and I'm so grateful that Asian Women Giving Circle is providing support for specially processed American meat, which uses Spam the canned meat as a metaphor for the Asian American experience because just like Spam, Asian Americans are born in the U.S., marginalized, and often shaped by war. I'd like to take this moment to thank Asian Women's Giving Circle for supporting us from the very beginning. White supremacy will always try to divide and conquer black and brown people. It is up to us to recognize that and to resist the trap. Me and my fellow Asian American women cast and crew have really reflected on imperialism, assimilation, race, class throughout the development process. And especially during these tough times, it's so important to have a sense of community and solidarity. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because there is an awakening happening in our city, in our country, and all over the world. I celebrate you all. We are a circle of care and giving. We are bodies of sensuality and desires and beauty. Bodies that can experience trauma and fear and hate. This is our small way of combating racism during these times and I'm so grateful that Asian Women Giving Circle is providing that support for us to do that. And I'm so excited to share it with you uh, when it's ready. And together, we can transform these experiences, uplift our stories to truth, wisdom, and joy. Thank you. Oh my God, you know, I've seen that so many times and I love it every time. It's so nice to be here with you in this virtual room. It warms my heart to be here together with you, even via our screens. Um, it has been a year, man. We have been through collective hardship, violence. Many of us have lost loved ones. Collective woes, we believe, deserve collective responses. We've also seen the resilience and strength of our community and in being and acting together. The Asian Women Giving Circle was born a collective of Asian American women. And over 15 years later, we remain a group of grassroots donor activists who support Asian American cultural creators who are using the power of arts to move our collective narratives towards more equity and justice. One of the things I'm really proud about um, we have a body of work, right? But this year we gave unsolicited, no strings attached mini grants to every single one of our 2019 grantee partners because artists and arts and cultural organizations are among the hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm proud we did this because it was the right thing to do. My only regret is that we didn't have the funds to give mini grants to all of our alumni grantee partners. You might have seen a quote as you were in the waiting room, Kehan Arani, a poet, writer, and performance artist who we have um, been proud to partner with for a couple of several years, wrote back to us that the Asian Women Giving Circle holds me so dearly in your thoughts and places such deep trust in me is moving me to tears. My gratitude for seeing me and having my back. 
We've been called the aunties cheering on the sidelines the first and only Asian American funders, the big sisters, the neighbors and friends, and one of my personal favorites, our only supporter who isn't a blood relative. And we love being the first monies in. We come together tonight to remember and mourn, but also to celebrate the power and necessity of imagination. It is artists, narrative and cultural creators who lead the way reimagining with and for us a society in which all of us are free. It is my honor and pleasure to hand the mic to one of the artist activists we've been so proud to partner with, a badass narrative culture creator and a surfer, Kit Yan. <laughs> I had to sneak it in, Kat. <laughs> Kit, Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Holly, for that wonderful introduction. I've never been introduced as my, for, thank you for seeing me, my true self as a surfer. <laughs> um, this is the first time I've identified such uh, publicly. But um, hi, everybody. It, my name is Kit. I use they, he, and she pronouns. I identify as queer and transgender, and I'm dialing in today from Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway peoples. And I am just thrilled to be here. Um, I know that in this moment, um, we are holding so many feelings simultaneously as Holly had described in terms of being um, the, the heartache and sadness, rage and anger, but also as a community, the joy, the strength and the resilience that we all simultaneously hold. So um, I'm popping in very quickly just to uh, sort of set up today's gala. And then I'll be right back uh, with a bunch of exciting and special guests. So we're gonna start today off um, with small breakout rooms uh, where we'll have an opportunity to connect with each other a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, a quick announcement, we'll be recording the event for archival purposes and future uses, but we will not be using people's individual faces or homes without their permission. And we will not be recording the breakout rooms. Um, and also, I. I know everyone's doing this already, but we've got a really active, exciting chat. So we encourage folks to use the reactions uh, in the Zoom uh, sphere and also to chat and say hi to each other and connect uh, that way as well. Um, in our small groups, we're about to break out and uh, Shin will break us out into, into the corners. Uh, we're gonna ask folks to turn their cameras off if they want and grab an object, take 30 seconds to look around your space, to center yourself um, and ground yourself wherever you are and to get an object that describes uh, whatever the phrase stronger together, uh, you know, says to you. And when we come back, we're going to uh, briefly hold them up and, and share with each, with each other. So, um, Thanks so much, Shin, for breaking us all out. We're gonna to head to our breakout rooms momentarily. I'm gonna go look for mine too, I'm excited. Um, and one more time for folks who are joining, we're looking for an object that means uh, stronger together, whatever stronger together means for us, we'll find an object to bring back to our small group and, and discuss. Welcome back, everyone. Um, let's see. Uh, we're going to do a, a quick um, screenshot of everyone with their objects. If you would like to be a part of the group photo, I've got a, I've got my moon here. So uh, just hold it up in the screen. We're going to do a quick screen grab. So I'll be doing a screen grab. So one, two, three. And let me go to the next room because like my screen doesn't have everybody. So I'm gonna, <laughs> okay, one more time, folks. All right, one, two, three. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and welcome back, folks. Uh, I hope you had a really beautiful, connected breakout room and space. Um, thank you to Shalini for taking the group photo. Um, I am super um, honored to welcome our first uh, special guest tonight. 
Kelly Sai is an award-winning multidisciplinary artist working at the intersection of art and activism. She is a multi-year recipient of grants from The Giving Circle, and her work has been seen on HBO, The Brooklyn Museum, Hear Arts, among many more. She is prolific. She is a friend, and I am so honored that she is joining us today. We're so lucky to have her share with us her brand new piece. Um, and after we witness this incredible art, we'll take a moment to be in conversation about it. Um, and I'm gonna take this moment to shout out our technical geniuses, Andine, who will queue up the video and is the person behind all the putting together everything on video today. And Shin, who is also linking uh, the other technical genius linking everyone's work in the chat. So uh, take it away, Andine. We're gonna watch Kelly Sai's new piece. Wrap you in my love. It comes from so far away. Wrap you in my love. I offer you. I offer you this way, wrap you in my love, for every kind of pain, I see your eyes closed, as you dream, as you dream, I When hands meet out to hands, what is the meaning of the meeting? I wrap you in my love, let it cast a shield for your pain. The sacrifice, the sacrifice. The sacrifice that has no name. The sacrifice, the sacrifice, the sacrifice that has no name. That was incredible. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, it's great to see you. Hey, so good to see you and everyone in this virtual space. Um, super happy to be here. And thank you again. Um, uh, so happy to be here. Yeah. Um, before we get started, I know we wanted to take a quick moment to uh, honor Corky Lee. And uh, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll just, should I jump in real quick? Sure. It, um, well, uh, well, I had mentioned a kid that before we got started, I wanted us to honor Corky because the last time, um, for those of you who know Corky Lee, who's the famed photographer who basically photographed all of us, you know, at many different points. But the last time I saw him was actually the last event that Kit and I had done for AWGC. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just such a huge giant um, in our community with such a huge heart. And I feel like every day that we go on, um, the more that we can live out his spirit of generosity, of sincerity and of vision, um, the better we can be. So I just wanted to like lift our spirits up to Corky, um, one of the great people that we've lost during COVID. Um, so just out of respect, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I certainly feel uh, Corky's presence with us today. And I, I so clearly remember the first time I ever met him um, at a community event. I remember him um, sort of pulling me aside and, and going like, 
oh, can I take your picture? And I, I, I remember having this thought, like, like me, like I'm not special. Like, why would you want to take my picture? And I think that's the beautiful thing about Corky's work is that he, he was there to see the unseen and hear the unheard and to lift us all up. And so it, it is certainly an honor today to, um, to remember him. Um, thanks, Kelly, for, for leading us in that. Um, and thank you for your beautiful piece. I'd love to take some time to, to just hear um, what inspired you and, and to sort of just actually maybe hear how you're doing too today. Yeah, um, well, definitely. This piece came about after the shootings in Atlanta um, at Young's Massage Parlor. Um, uh, Asian American Writers Workshop had asked me to be a part of the marathon reading for the Women Warriors Solidarity Reading. And to be honest, in quarantine, I have not, I, what I found myself turning to was to movement and, and my dance practice. I mean, not a lot of people know that I grew up as a classically trained dancer. When I first came to New York, I did a lot of choreographic work with different theater companies and things like that. And I think in this time of extreme grief, um, I just had to move you know, constantly, <laughs> you know, so I've been like dancing my ass off, you know, during, um, you know, COVID, which has been such an unexpected thing, but I think it really speaks to, you know, what is the path of the artist and, you know, thinking that you can plan everything out and that things are going to make sense and X, Y, Z is like, it's not like that, you know, at least it's not for me. I don't know, <laughs> you know, for anybody else. Um, but I just found myself dancing and I've been making music kind of like on the low for like the last four or five years. And I really just found myself um, reaching for those things, you know, when we are hit in this kind of, um, you know, time of multiple traumas, you know, I know all of us have, uh, you know, sustained the impacts of this last year and how it's affect our work, our relationships, our bodies, our minds, our spirits, you know, losing different people either directly to COVID or even just losing people in the midst of this and not being able to grieve that. I know I had experienced that multiple times throughout um, the pandemic, and I'm sure many of you have too. Um, so when I really thought about um, what was happening inside of me, just the words to the song came, not even the words, the melody to the song came, and then the words came, and then the movement came, and then the visual imagery came. And I just, it was one of those things. And I find this with a lot of stuff that I do that I don't know what it's going to be, you know, when I started, like, I didn't, I, I really thought it was going to be something totally different when I started. And I was like, oh, I'm making a dance film. Okay. It's, it's done. Here it is. So, um, so it really means a lot to be able to share it and, um, to be able to, you know, I guess, I mean, if anything, it's like, and AWGC is so amazing in this in terms of supporting so many different artists at different points in their career and also in so many different kinds of mediums, you know? And I think that all these different ways of speaking can be really valuable to us, um, especially when we're going through challenging times like this. And, and then there's also kind of like your neurological stuff when you think about, you know, the brain centers that organize writing and language are actually different than the brain centers that organize music and dance and how we move through time, um, you know, which are all separate from our visual understanding. So, you know, God gave us all these things to work with. So I'm gonna work Absolutely. with it all. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, something that was coming up for me as I watched Six was um, some the feeling that sometimes when there are no words, what do you do and where do you turn and how do you find the words that live inside you? And I, I felt that um, I could feel you finding the words through movement, through through song, through rhythm. Um, and I, I think that that's something that's so powerful about your work. Um, and I, I know I'm gonna say, I, I'm gonna uh, say this, that uh, when I first moved to New York, you were like one of the first people I called and I was like, Kelly, can you help me? I, I wanna be an artist. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, and I remember we, us sitting there and you were so generous and you asked me a bunch of questions. You didn't sit there and give me a bunch of advice. And I find that to be really um, something powerful and resonant in your work is the, the questions that you ask, the invitation, the opening. So I'd love to know a little bit about what questions you are, uh, are, are sort of uh, that you are wrestling with in this piece, but also like in the moment of, of your art now. 
Yeah, and thank you. And Kit, that's so sweet to <laughs> bring that memory to the space. And, and really like an astute understanding. I know sometimes I exhaust people with it. One of my friends says, who's an artist the other day, he's like, you know, you're gonna have a bunch of questions. I'm like too tired to talk to you. But um, yeah, you know, actually, honestly, early in my career in spoken word, a lot of times people think of spoken word as like, I have this point of view and I'm going to show you what what's up, you know, whatever. And I kind of, I'm sure I have pieces that are like that, but I know early on in my career, I really was like, I really want to put a question into people's minds. That was really what my explicit goal was, you know? Um, and I think some of the questions that I'm asking myself right now is, um, and you know, Hallie and I dialogued about this a little bit in prior to this meeting or to this event, um, you know, just about the place of rage and activism and what is the sustainability of that? What is the role of that? Mm. Um, and how do we move through it, you know, um, because to share like a personal circumstance for me, I think that maybe about five or six years ago, I really had to really question really hard about this role of rage and anger. And I have been that fiery, angry, you know, like, you know, energizing, like, ah, you know, person mm. and poet. And that was very natural to me. Um, but about like in around 2015, I experienced a series of losses. My father passed away. I had a former student who was a young African-American male in um, the Midwest who was killed by a police officer. Um, and at that time, I was it was, it was kind of crazy timing because the, literally the day that I found out he had been murdered, I was actually a part of an artist police officer empathy training program. So mm -hmm. I had literally spent that entire day with police officers talking about police murders and talking about um, police violence and police brutality. And I was actually sitting with this group of police officers and police officers in training as they were talking about how could they do this differently? And what were the things that they needed emotionally in order to, um, to not have things like this occur? You know, so this was this very small uh, special pilot program. I had no idea that it would hit literally so personally, like literally the first night that I went home was when I found out that my friend had been murdered. Um, so to be honest, going through those multiple losses, and I had a, a couple other friends pass away during that time, I just really found myself in a place where I was like, all of this anger and all of this rage is not going to bring my friend back. Like it's not, you know, and all of this anger and this rage cannot um, solve the absence that he, you know, has left, you know, um, with the loss of his life. He was an educator. He taught autistic kids. That's not how he was depicted in the media. They depicted him as a criminal, you know, um, which was like, when he was honored, it's like you're depicting him as a criminal, but he was also like an honor student and like a grandmama's boy and had a huge, amazing smile and worked with kids, you know? And um, so it's, it was a real turning point, I will say for me, quite honestly, in terms of really thinking about the role of anger and rage and like, what does it mean to move forward when you are carrying the pain and the reality of those losses? And these aren't ideological, they're personal, they're real. Those people that you love are not coming back. Um, so that's just kind of like, I started to really grapple with a lot of those spiritual questions, you know? And um, so in terms of questions that I've been asking myself is like, how do we um, not respond, but how do we intervene? Hmm. How do we not yeah. react, but counteract? And one of my friends um, who uh, is an aide to a US Senator right now, years ago, he said to me, he's like, you know, when I see people like you, I usually run in the other direction. He's like, I hate activists. I hate activists, you know, cause he's worked in government so long. He's like, you know why? He's like, you know why I hate activists? He's like, because y'all are too late. You're too late. He's like, we've been having meetings about this stuff in the government, you know, like 25 years. He was talking about the Brooklyn Navy Yards. He's like, this has been happening for like 15 years and you all want to protest in the last three months. He's like, you all are too late. That's what drives me crazy about you. Um, so it's a funny way to say it, but it's a real way to say it that, you know, sometimes, especially right now, given the nature of social media and um, kind of consciousness raising and uh, certain forms of like a national ideological activism that we're constantly responding to everything that's happening in the second. Um, but I am asking myself, um, what are the currents that are happening underneath right now that I can intervene more upstream from and 
it, it's kind of like weird, like time travel stuff, you know, because if you intervene soon enough, then maybe it won't even happen. You know <laughs> what I mean? So you won't, no one will really know that you had done anything. You won't even know if you've done anything, but that's maybe an important space to be in. Mm. So for myself personally, that's what I've been, um, thinking about, you know, knowing that everyone has a different journey when it comes, where it comes to their activism and where they want to put their time and their energy and their heart and their spirit. And I know that for me, um, that there's certain things emotionally, spiritually, and then tactically that are important to me that are still like emotion that I'm still figuring out, you know, as we all are. You know? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing that. I'm, I'm sorry for your, your losses. And I certainly am grateful for the work and that you do um, and all the ways in which you um, create art and conversation and ask questions. And I totally hear you on, on the story you were telling about um, art and activism too, and operating from a place of like, what do we need as a community? Where, how do we help each other? How do we lift each other? And if that is the, the constant questions that we're asking, then as we move through this world and things come up, we are able to see each other and, and to keep asking the questions. Mm -hmm. For sure. And to tack on to that, I think a really important point, I mean, this sounds kind of rando, but um, when Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, you know, because he's like, okay, fine, I'll save this newspaper. He bought the Washington Post. And so being Jeff Bezos, he did like a, a massive survey, you know, like research on like, well, what has happened to newspapers? Why is the Washington Post in such like a crappy situation that I can just like buy it and et cetera, et cetera. And he said that over the last, I don't know exactly what time period, maybe last 10 years, last 20 years, he said, what's happened is because with the growth of the internet, things that used to have local power um, don't anymore. You know, like local newspapers don't have power, local institutions don't have power, but things are on a national scale. So when we talk about a lot of social issues right now, we talk about a lot of things on a national scale, but he was talking about how um, with the decimation of local news and local news reporting and the strength of that, there's studies that show that civic engagement is directly tied to how much to the strength of local news providers. And again, I'm sorry, I'm saying this anecdotally, but I swear it's, I, I read all this, it's true. Um, but uh, so, you know, in this moment, it's important to see what's in the news cycle, but also understanding in this given moment, we are really suffering in terms of knowing what's happening in our own localities. Absolutely. And that's why some of the work that Asian Women's Giving Circle is so amazing when we're thinking about New York City and what can, you know, really make such a difference here. Um, but it's, it's harder to find out what's happening in our local communities. It, it, it may be easier sometimes to, to know what's happening in a larger trending national news story than to know what's happening in the neighborhood to neighborhoods away from you, you know? So it's just something to keep in mind for those of us who care about social justice and social change. How do we deal with that, um, dysfunction in information amongst the many dysfunctions in information, but just particularly around local versus national. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much, Kelly. I, uh, I feel like we could sit here all night and just <laughs> be at, at the Church of Kelly. Oh, sure. um, and, and thank you very much so much for genuinely sharing your, your art, your heart and, and your perspectives. And um, I'm so grateful um, for your presence today. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing six with us. Oh, for sure. Thank you all so much. You also just so sweet. I know everyone, there's a bunch of badasses all over the Zoom. So it's really great to just bring everyone together. Thank you, Kelly. And please visit uh, kellyside.com for more information on Kelly's work. Great to see you. Thank you. Um, let's see. We are uh, have another special guest tonight. And uh, let me see. The Huffington Post has named her one of the 50 funniest women. She is a social justice comedian, the writer of Muslims Are Coming, Hug a Muslim, and she uses comedy as a vehicle to start conversations. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce a wonderful cameo from Nagin. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I've been thinking recently a lot about privilege. The word gets bandied about a lot. And, uh, and I'm an Iranian-American Muslim. Uh, and who isn't? Uh, and, um, and I was thinking, like, what is my form of privilege? And I realized that it, it, it amounts mostly 
to, and it's pretty cool, um, getting a, a dollar off at the fruit stand when I do a nice assalamu alaikum to the fruit stand guy on First Avenue. Um, that, I do, I do get that discount, and that is um, Muslim privilege. Uh, but one thing I've noticed is that that one dollar off um, is not enough to pursue a career in the arts, which is why we have people like the Asian Women Giving Circle um, who support artists and do such a phenomenal job. So thank you so much. I'm honored to be here and I'm honored to know you and I'm exceedingly honored to be supported by you. Thank you so much, Nagin, and please visit Nagin farsad.com for more information and uh, she actually has a show on june 8th which we're going to drop in the chat as well uh it's called the vaccine passport show she says it'll be fun and there's booze <laughs> so please <laughs> check out nagin's show on june 8th the link will be in the chat um how's it how how is everyone doing Go, kid. Doing good? okay i know it's so hard when we're all on mute but you're doing great kid Oh, thank you. I, I'm feeling <laughs> yeah, the energy from everybody present today, so I really appreciate all the, all the love. And we are about to introduce a whole lot of love next. Um, over the last 16 years, the Asian Women's Giving Circle has funded over 80 amazing projects that amplify the power of arts and culture to more equity and justice for all our communities. And we will be showing a small, a short video of some recently funded projects. And in the chat, there will be a few links to donate um, to support and amplify the power of arts and culture um, through the Asian Women's Giving Circle. And uh, please go ahead and um, talk to each other as well in the chat as the video plays. I am just, I'm thrilled to, to see all the grantees. I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. As a pastor of a conservative um, church, a Southern Baptist church, you know, we believe that the Bible taught that homosexuality is a sin. Drew came out to me in August of 2013, and when he came out to me, he told me, Dad, please don't tell anyone. <laughs> This 1967 Mercury station wagon is the Care Force One, inspired by some of the incredible caregivers I've met. This is Giramina. She recently founded one of the first worker-owned cleaning cooperatives in the Bay Area that's run entirely by Latina immigrant women. <laughs> When we went to Topaz, it was still being built. My father was an architect, so that he was picked to supervise the remaining construction that was being done. And for instance, you know, they were building the hospital. Most of the barracks were built. Some people in the community couldn't trust him totally because he was too buddy-buddy with the administration. At the solicitation of Japan, was still in conversation with its government and its emperor, looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. We didn't know that this kind of thing wasn't done, but we just did it. 
getting signatures, having people sign up, or just talking about his case. Demonstrations, hundreds of people were always there. Court hearings, hundreds of people were there. The Chosa Lee movement had a life of its own. When the court is packed and the case becomes political, victory is of a different ill. It's a victory for the whole community. The night that Song Yang was killed, another one of her colleagues also attempted to escape the building by jumping out the back window, resulting in a crippling back injury that forced her to return to China for medical treatment. If I could communicate to Yang Song, I would just say that your work is real work. Your work is valuable. Your work is not criminal. Wow, that was just incredible. Uh, that was, it was so beautiful. I, I was able to watch this video um, before tonight in, in preparation for this gala. And I remember the feeling of just thinking that our community is so powerful and strong. And there are so many stories out there that I had not been familiar with that I went and um, looked up. And it is the work of our, our activists and artists who, remember us, who see us, who see our lives and see our communities and uh, turn, turn that into um, powerful art, powerful message, powerful just spiritual experiences. So uh, congratulations to all the grantees. And I am so grateful for this Giving Circle for doing the work of continuing to support artists and activists doing, doing this. Um, I want to take a moment to just tell you a little bit about my own journey and relationship with The Giving Circle. And in case you joined a little later, my name is Kit Yan and I use they, she and he pronouns. Um, I'm the MC tonight and just a, a conduit for all the incredible artists in this space. Um, and I write plays and musicals for stage and screen. Uh, all of my stories center queer and transgender Asian Americans, and all of my work is in service of making this world a safer place for transgender people of color, because in today's society, 30% uh, of trans people have experienced homelessness, 89% of trans youth have thought about or attempted suicide, and 100% of trans and non-binary people have experienced medical discrimination. I write plays and musicals that humanize trans people and especially trans Asian folks because when our identities are reflected on stage and screen, we are able to live fuller, healthier lives in society. In 2012, my writing partner, Melissa Lee, who we'll see in a little bit, and I started working on our very first musical together called Interstate. Our mission was simple to tell the story of our lives, a transgender poet and a lesbian singer songwriter who formed a band and hit the road to find queer Asian community across America. We worked on the piece for six years until 2018 when we got our first big break, acceptance into the New York Musical Festival. But that was also when we hit our first big roadblock. We needed about $80,000 to pay all the queer and trans people of color on our nearly 40 person team. At this point, uh, no in institutions had produced our work yet. We had no awards as a team and we didn't know how to raise funds. But that is when our community stepped up to help us and the Asian Women's Giving Circle gave us our very first grant, which kickstarted our funding campaign and helped us reach our goal. It always takes like one person to say yes for more people to keep saying yes. For us, that money helped fund the production, but where the money came from was more important. We work in a field where there are no Asian American lead commercial producers, where only 28% of lead producers are women, and there are zero trans lead producers. In our community, if our communities are not, are not a part of who funds the shows, 
we will never be able to get our shows on stage in an equitable way. That's why it was a huge morale boost to have our show be supported by our communities and to feel seen, affirmed, and heard in our storytelling. The Asian Women's Giving Circle is an artistic family and home for us. And we could not have made that first leap in our careers without this support. Since 2018, Melissa and I have gone on to win a few uh, top industry prizes to be commissioned by some of America's largest theaters. And we're currently writing a music, movie musical for one of the largest uh, movie studios in the world, all in service of telling queer and transgender Asian American stories and giving back to our communities. But we couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> we couldn't have done anything without our community believing in us and supporting us before having any commercial work or institutional backing. Today, the Giving Circle is raising money to help more people like us, more people like me, make work that matters in our community. Every dollar goes towards someone's dream of making this world a better place. And so um, we are encouraging folks to give what they can in how, whatever way feels good to you, all donation, contribution amounts are extremely important and every everything folks do um, and contribute today goes directly towards paying artists and activists in and helping them make their work uh, there uh, I I it is my great honor now to um, introduce uh, our final performance for the evening but also please keep on keep on pledging in the chat and keep on talking to each other as well and keep the reactions coming. Um, I get to introduce my collaborator and writing partner, Melissa Lee, which is super exciting. Uh, she is going to come on and sing a song from our musical Interstate, the show that the Giving Circle supported in the New York Musical Festival. And uh, this is actually, the newest song from our show. It is uh, the latest edition. And we chose this song because we think it speaks to the, the moment and the feelings um, in this moment and also the, the power of our community. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring my writing partner, Melissa Lee on uh, to, to play a song. And also again, please uh, keep, keep the love coming in the chat. Okay, she, we're in the same room and it's a live show. So I'm going to move to the side and she's gonna come on the screen. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Lee. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and I am so excited to be here. As Kit mentioned earlier, um, the Asian Women's Giving Circle really gave us our, like, was the first to support us um, with um, a grant. And so it was, it's just been, it's just been such an honor um, for, to, to be here and um, to be here sharing this piece that, that you all help support. So thank you so much. Um, so our show, Interstate, is, um, is about, uh, is kind of a semi-autobiographical show about me and Kit. Um, in 2008, we went on the road um, doing poetry and music. And so in this show, it's about a trans slam poet who goes on the road with a lesbian singer songwriter. And uh, this song is called Holding Me Down and it uh, takes place in the first act. And um, Adrian, the lesbian singer songwriter, has been feeling really invisibilized, invisible throughout the whole show. And so this is her sort of breaking point, her moment uh, in terms of the pressures that we, she feels with her family and also uh, the pressures of not really feeling seen in her partnership with her, uh, with her collaborator. So hope you enjoy. That's what she said, I'll never reach my destination. A daydream that's in my head, a figment of my imagination. Songs made out of air, words that are just shattered through snow waves that make their ways to things that do not matter. 
But what about me? What about me? Funny how she can be there your whole life and not know you. Shut up, go to college. They got wisdom and knowledge to bestow you. I feel myself disappearing. I feel myself sinking and starting to drown. Is it possible my love for you is holding me down? Funny how they can hear you sing your song, but not see you. Playing back up in the backdrop, you're silent as a stage prop, no one needs you. I feel myself disappearing. I feel myself screaming without making a sound. Is it possible my love for you is holding me down? the smiles down with politeness because this story is my life so I'm the only one who can write in this and the fans and the cheers and the lights and everything in between it's nothing compared to what I want most to be seen myself from disappearing until they know my name in every city and town and I'll never let my love for you oh me down thank you good stay <laughs> Okay, now I'm gonna jump in your chair. Okay, come. We're gonna stop sharing. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Melissa, Thanks. for that beautiful yeah. performance, and uh, and and thank you all for um, for supporting our work, for having me tonight, for allowing me to share the space and and join in community with you. Uh, really, interstate. When I think about interstate, I think about the Asian Women's Giving Circle, and I think about the community that has been on this journey with us and we're filled with gratitude. Thank you, Kit and Melissa for trying this live performance. It was a big risk and it was lovely. Thank you very much for both of you. We're really excited to have been part of your Broadway career. Um, it's really awesome. Everybody don't go. We have a three minute after party. I also want to thank Kelly, who I saw for the first time, maybe 12 years ago at the Brooklyn Museum. And I remember going up to her. She was doing really uh, assertive uh, hip hop uh, spoken word at that time. So uh, we've been with uh, Kelly through her whole journey. And I think she was the MC for a Ms. Foundation gala as well. So I don't know if Teresa Younger is still on, if she remembers that. Um, our grantee showcase and Nagin Fursad's cameo really demonstrates the power and creativity that's out there and that needs your support and recognition. If you donate this month, as we've said, you get to vote for the 2021 grantees. So in June, we mail out the ballot. And if you contribute um, before we mail out the ballot, uh, you will get it and be able to participate. It's really our commitment to grassroots philanthropy. And it gives you, the donor, a, vo a direct voice in the grantees. And we, um, 
we wanted this uh, virtual showcase to be as intimate as our uh, live events where we bring our grantees to meet um, our donor community too. So it's really important for all of us to um, work together. And I see people are covening my um, um, necklace. I wanted to thank Kit Chow as well for Reels Right Now, who did a fabulous job in putting together our videos and really, um, really made it. So thank you, Kat. Um, Chen Yi of Red Canary Song and Shirvana of Jahaji Sisters really brought the powerful voice of our grantees to um, our videos as well and to the voices of Asian women. Our Behind the Wizard is Andine, whom uh, we have thanked as well, and, and she really made um, this event possible. So thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Kit and Melissa for your musical talent and Kit for emceeing tonight. Sisters, families, AAPI community and our allies, thank you for joining us. Thank you Kappa for amplifying AAPI Heritage Month and joining with us. We are stronger together. And together, I think we're going to make 2021 an amazing year for possibly a revolution. And now for our wonderful after party, don't go. And we want to share with you the newest hits, the Linda Lindys. And I'm sure many of you have heard them already. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone.